Good afternoon, everybody. Is my audio okay, too, in the back? All right, thanks. Um, thank you all for coming on an afternoon. I'm glad you found us all the way over here in the corner. Um, I see a lot of folks standing. Um, there are still some seats, so if you're uncomfortable, if you're sitting on the side, that's cool. Um, I know sometimes I like to plug in, but uh, there are some seats, so I'm sure you can squeeze in if you'd like to. Um, my name is Whit Mateau. This is Sam Libby. Uh, we work in our services group, professional services. We are architects and technical consultants, so we work with a lot of organizations, um, probably like many of yours, to design and implement systems. That's, that's kind of what we do. Uh, we're also both working on a um, sort of cross-divisional thing at Esri called the Well-Architected Framework. I don't know, did you guys see that on Wednesday? Okay, cool. Um, Actually, quick show of hands, how many folks were at Sam and my session on Tuesday? All right, cool, so good amount. Super. Yeah, we're not gonna like dive into the well-architected framework today exactly. Uh, we're gonna focus more on sort of the process of designing and implementing well-architected, like even what is a well-architected system? How does one approach designing and implementing it? And then how would you use the best practices in the well-architected framework during that? So we'll definitely touch on the well-architected framework, but this is a little bit more holistic and I think a little bit deeper than the session on Tuesday. So hopefully it'll be complimentary. <clears throat> By way of a little bit of context, um, you know, I think we use this word system a lot. Uh, sometimes we talk about ArcGIS as a system or the ArcGIS system. When we say that, usually what we mean is that ArcGIS is a collection of software, of components, of technology, of products that are designed to work well together. That's kind of like what a system is. It has a boundary, which is what we call ArcGIS. There's a bunch of pieces and they work well together. Um, but what we're actually talking about here is not ArcGIS, the system, but the systems that you experience within your organizations. And so that's maybe the distinction we're mentioning here is that ArcGIS is actually experienced by users through systems. It's something that you deploy in some cases if you're using software or that you access directly if it's running in the cloud like ArcGIS Online or ArcGIS Platform. And so what we're really talking about here is not just this ArcGIS system, but the systems that you have to design and implement to fulfill your users' needs within your organization. So a little bit more on that. Um, <clears throat> there's three main types of systems, I guess, or ways you might think of GIS as a system within your organization. Again, focusing on that middle part, like the, the, the systems that you all experience. One, and probably the most popular and common, is what we might refer to as like a multi-purpose or multi-function GIS. You've deployed ArcGIS, and I use deploy in a very general context, or you have one ArcGIS online organization, or you have one deployment of ArcGIS Enterprise that's really filling the vast majority of needs within your organization. I think this is how most organizations start. Um, a lot of small to mid-sized organizations can get everything they want out of one deployment of ArcGIS or one system um, that's providing all the functionality they need to the whole organization. But there's, I think, increasingly different types of systems that um, your organizations are experiencing with ArcGIS. The next one is what we might call a GIS enabled system. And this is kind of more the idea that there are other enterprise systems or information systems running in your organization. Could be a facility management system, an asset management system, a customer relationship management system. And those things are not Esri-based. They're from SAP or IBM or Oracle or Salesforce or whatever. Or maybe they're something you home built out of your organization, but they need some GIS capabilities. And this is really about embedding or integrating capabilities from ArcGIS into that system. Um, so that's a lot to do with integration, and we will talk about integration today. Uh, but that's another type of system that you may have in your organization that's not GIS centric, but is GIS enabled. Um, the third one 
which is a big part, I think, of what we're talking about here and what we also talk in, about in the Well Arctic Framework is this idea of a more business-focused system or an industry-focused system, which is actually taking like a, a well-defined subset of the capabilities of ArcGIS. It may be a subset of the products, a subset of the capabilities of the functionality, um, and tailoring the configuration deployment of that system to meet very specific business needs. Um, and what ends up happening is you may end up with multiple deployments of ArcGIS, multiple ArcGIS-based systems in your organization that are supporting different business units or different needs. You may have a general sort of self-service mapping system where users across the organization can go to explore, find stuff, create. But you may have other like mission critical business applications that cannot go down, they don't change very often, but are critical to the success of the business. Those are maybe operated in a different system. You may then have a data editing and management system where users um, log in, they use largely desktop tools, and they're managing the authoritative data that powers the organization. And then there may be a whole separate one where you're doing large scale analytics on massive volumes of data, introspect and observe through all the systems you have to make better strategic decisions within the organization. These are different examples. You're not gonna put all of those into one deployment of ArcGIS because they have different needs, different purposes, different service level requirements. And so this third pattern is something we're increasingly seeing organizations that are implementing GIS maybe at like enterprise scale evolving to. Um, and so we just want to maybe paint a little bit of a context as we get into well-architected systems, like what do we actually mean by system? And it can be all three of these. And I think most of what we'll talk about today apply to, to all three of these, um, maybe a little bit more skewed towards the third one. I would just add one comment, just to be clear that there's no perceived or real hierarchy or preference across this. We're not saying that people should be moving in one direction. These all have value in organizations of all sizes. So there's lots of good reasons to do this. What helps those to think about in, as you enter into designing a system, is it in one of these areas is the first step to think about. And that might help to guide your decisions, the questions you ask and choices you make. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Sam. So we thought, you know, okay, so now that's context you could say, now we wanna get into the meat of the session. Um, we thought we would start by actually asking ourselves and talking to you all about what we think makes a system well architected. Okay, so we've released this framework. We talk a lot about, you know, the well architected framework for designing systems, but, you know, immediately folks started asking Sam and I, well, what is a well architected system? And forced us to kind of come up with a pretty succinct definition of that, which I think will help guide a lot of what we talk about today. So we wanted to share with you what we think makes a system well architected. Um, the first idea is that it's driven by the business. Um, sometimes I think as technologists, we tend to get excited by technology and we create systems with technology um, because it has cool tools or cool features, but it may or may not be driven by real business need. And so generally speaking, a system that's well architected delivers the capabilities and the workflows and the level of service. We'll get into what that means in a little bit, um, but you know, reliability, availability, performance, things like that, that the business needs. So business first is something we say a lot. Um, a good system is driven by the business. The next idea is that it's uh, intentional. And what we mean by that is that it's designed thoughtfully, methodically, and with intent. Um, at some level, this means having a process, and at some level, it means taking into consideration a lot of important architectural domains and considerations as you think about the system and knowing where to focus your limited time as you design the system. We're gonna talk a lot about those things today, like where to focus time. Um, but at some level, it's like saying, well, I, something like, I'm not gonna do high availability, you know, that's fine. But think about reliability and why you're choosing not to do high availability. Don't just skip over that, you know, consider the options and how those options align to 
you know, you're given organizational requirements. So it's, it's just going through a process and being really intentional with the decisions you're making about um, your architecture. I think it's equally important to be clear about what you're not going to do in the system, what you're not going to deploy as it is to what you are going to offer. Yeah. Because we've all seen systems that have grown from a base idea and then added on more and more and more over time until they're unmanageable and too complicated. Being intentional about putting a bounding box around that is really important. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, the next idea here is about flexibility. And this is, at some level, taking into consideration the requirements you have now as well as where you may expect the system to go into the future. Uh, but there's only so much you can do about predicting where things are go going, especially these days. So we generally recommend starting with a really strong foundation as much as you can. If this is a new system, consider all of these different architectural factors we're going to get into today and, and build a good foundation such that it can adapt reasonably flexibly as the needs of the business and IT direction evolve. Um, you know, this is something that's always within reason. As I said, you can't predict the future, but um, rather than designing a system that only meets your very specific needs you have in the immediate near term, consider where you think it might go. And as you're making decisions about things like, you know, reliability and security deployment options, you're you're not precluding yourself too much from going in a direction you think your organization might want you to go. That's, again, a little bit of a balance, but designing with flexibility in mind these days, I think, is, is an important tenant of a well-architected system. This one's kind of obvious, you know, follow best practices, but who, I guess, whose best practices? So one is gonna be Esri's best practices. That's something we'll touch on today, actually a lot, of, a large portion of this session will be focusing on what we think are best practices for architecting ArcGIS. But ArcGIS isn't the only thing involved. You're probably deploying ArcGIS on a cloud provider, let's say. What are the cloud provider's best practices? But perhaps most importantly is what your IT organization's best practices are. Something we don't talk a lot about in this session, but I guess just wanted to take a moment to highlight is the importance of a collaborative, strong working relationship between, um, we'll say, business, GIS, and IT. GIS may live in different parts of your organization. I see a lot of GIS teams work within IT. Sometimes they're in a business department. Sometimes they're separate. I think one of the things we found is that to really successfully implement, not just implement, but operate, uh, a, an enterprise ArcGIS-based system requ requires IT. Um, we'll talk more about who to get involved when in the process, but at a really high level, we want to be thinking about involving and working closely with IT. And some of you may be IT, um, but early in the process and following as, as much as can all of the guidelines and standards, constraints, best practices of IT within your organization. Um, it will help ensure that not only do you build the right system, but that that system can be sustained and grown um, properly over time. Um, and this last idea is that, you know, this is like a journey, not an event, or, you know, the work of an architect or of a system implementer is really never done. Um, systems need to be continuously improved so they're established and then they're evolved through a process. And that process must involve the right people at the right time um, and iterate continuously through the system lifecycle. Um, we're gonna go into these last two best practices and this idea of continuous improvement through a process today. That's where we're gonna focus the majority of our time, I'd say. But we wanted to paint this complete picture of of um, you know, including business first, intentionality and flexibility. So let's start a little bit with this idea of a process before we dive deeper into kind of design and implementation best practices. Um, thought it was just worth painting a very high level picture first of what we see the life cycle of a well-architected system being. And this is pretty basic. I'm sure most of you are doing something very close to this today. We want to understand the needs of the users, the capabilities of the organization, the standards set forth by IT, et cetera, and use that to design our system. 
We then implement it. These sort of like little arrows around there, you can imagine we're, we're observing, we're monitoring, we're patching. This thing is, is going through a regular process of, of maintaining health. But then on a periodic basis, the whole thing is being revisited. You know, we're coming back and saying, are we doing the right thing? Do we have new workflows, new requirements? How does that impact the design? And then we implement that. And that may be on different cycles. That could be an annual thing, could be every six months, but it's probably in that general time frame. It's not like every five years we look at our system again. We want to be thinking about this thing being updated on a periodic basis. And that is a good cadence in which to also incorporate and consider new versions of Esri software, probably along with many other software versions like database uh, operating systems and such. But let's dive a little bit deep, deeper into like some of the areas you might consider focusing throughout this process. By the way, this process isn't like, it's pretty high level, you know. Um, there's other architectural de and application development processes like TOGAF, for example, is a popular one. Um, we're, we're not trying to say use one or, an other, or, or another. It, if your organization does use one of these, then we'd encourage you to follow it. What we're really kind of saying here is follow this high level thing. Um, but uh, you can see here we have under understand business architecture and under design technical architecture. I think that's a reasonable high level way of thinking about it, but it's also that is kind of a little TOGAF specific. If you use TOGAF, those are some TOGAF terminology, but they're also reasonably standard, I would say, in, 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 in industry. So some of the things to consider and focus on early in the process as you're understanding the needs, the high level business objectives, who your users are. It may make sense in some cases to interview direct users, but the closer you can get to the actual user, usually the better your outcome is gonna be. We often jump right into requirements. I think one thing we wanted to highlight here is to think hard about not just individual requirements, but workflows or you know, use cases, user stories, these things, but like, what are the steps somebody needs to follow? Um, that'll become very important later as we talk about things like change management. Uh, of course, the requirements. These last two are getting a little bit more into the technical or kind of IT domain. You know, what are the levels of service that the business needs? Um, not all of your organizations necessarily may have well-defined standards like tier one, tier two, tier three availability requirements and things like that. But generally speaking, the business should be able to articulate what level of availability, what level of performance, what level of security and such is required in order to, you know, meet the needs of that system. As we'll, as Sam will talk about later, it's easy to say, oh, it needs to be you know, highly available. I need three nines of availability and it's gotta be super secure, but those things all cost money, add complexity, and so it's important to get real about the service level and kind of non-functional requirements. As well as understand what are the standards within IT, um, it's gonna be more likely to be successful in the operations if you're aligning to and following standards than if you're introducing, some, introducing something brand new that IT has never seen before. So wherever it's possible or practical, using practices and processes and, and even in some cases technology that IT is already comfortable with will make it easier to operate. Um, the design process, this is where we're gonna spend some time today, but um, just wanted to highlight like there's different levels of design. Um, that part we're not going to get too deep into today, but we often think about design at a conceptual level, a logical level, and a physical level. We'd encourage you as you go through your design to think about it in a similar way. Conceptual design is really more about you know, kind of aligning high-level technology componentry and strategy to business needs and objectives. This is something that you might do first and it's something that can probably speak to like a C-level executive about what's actually happening within the system. Um, logical is starting to get deeper. I think that's where we spend a lot of time typically when we're working with organizations like yours. We're, now, we're not so much looking at this system in the context of the entire organization. We're focusing more on the design of this one system. 
We're looking at what software is involved, <clears throat> how those software pieces are kind of organized and grouped together, and then uh, how do they interact with each other. Um, and then when we get into the physical design, that's where we've probably made all of our technology choices for things like database providers, cloud providers, or infrastructure providers. We're thinking about things like networking, security layers, talking ports, individual interactions, um, machine sizes, number of CPUs. That's all physical. As you can see how these kind of build on each other. And you know, you may not have the time or the experience of the scope to do all of these things, and that's fine. You know, Sam and I spend most of our time probably in the logical space. Um, but I think it is good to acknowledge that all three of these things can be very helpful in, in going from the high level down into the details and providing continuity and consistency between them. And then in the implementation stage, this is pretty standard in a lot of ways. Um, probably no, no big surprises here. Often it does make sense to do a pilot or a proof of concept. Not always required, but if you're doing something really new, um, that's often helpful to get started. It reduces risk as well as helps show the business or the user, the stakeholders, sort of where we're going. Sometimes, especially when you're doing something really new, people don't know what they want until they see it. So um, doing it iteratively or doing a pilot is a good way to kind of show where things are going and you'll get additional feedback and, and kind of evolve during this process. Um, deployment, of course, is you know setting that up. Obviously, if we're doing something with SaaS, that's very rel or relatively straightforward. If you're doing something with enterprise or Kubernetes, that takes on a different meaning. Um, testing and releasing is hugely important. Probably don't need to stress that with you all. I'm sure you all know that. These are a little different. So one is verifying that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Releasing is kind of like managing different environments like development and test staging, production, managing expectation of the users, you know, getting users registered before it goes live, all these things that go into the actual release. Um, it can be often helpful to have a release manager on the team who does that as a job if that's, if that's something you have at your disposal. And then now we kind of get into the circular thing, right? We're, we're upgrading and maintaining it maybe doing critical patches, um, and then um, operating it, observing it, monitoring it, which both maintains health, as well as we'll see in a minute, gives us data that helps feed this revisiting step. This revisiting step is both to align with the evolving business and IT needs, as well as to learn from the use of the system. Um, which gets into this idea of observability we'll talk about today. Just one thing, one thing to add is that a lot of this is pretty optimistic. Right? We're talking about new systems with a fresh landscape in front of us. I know a lot of you are interested in how you evolve existing legacy systems. I think all of this is still relevant, and maybe it's an excuse to step back a bit and think of your new system not as a direct evolution of that legacy system, but as a new set of capabilities, objectives, workflows that might lead to a more novel or innovative design as you get there. Yeah, that's a great point. OK, so we're going to transition a little bit into best practices. Um, again, we're not going to do that purely through the framework. But what we did want to, for those of you that haven't seen it, or even if you've seen it, maybe take a little bit of a, of a tour through here. This is just going to be a few minutes. And then we're going to get into some, some best practices, which also help align those best practices to who and when in the process you should be thinking about. Um, all right, let me just jump over here. Maybe, actually, maybe first. I think you probably heard this, but um, this was released in December. Uh, it's a new resource that's really intended to help. Um, um, I mean, it's written primarily for IT and technical audiences. Maybe I'll sort of say, I think, at Esri, historically, we put a lot of energy into helping the users of a GIS. This is really a little different. It's really to help the operators of a GIS, the people that are keeping the GIS running. These are folks that are not necessarily you know, running a GP tool or making a map. 
Um, maybe they need to know enough about that to make sure that the mapping and geoprocessing pieces of the system work, but it's more written for the people that are you know, touching the infrastructure and designing and such, which I suspect are, are many of you, and Sam and I. Um, it has four pieces. We're gonna touch on um, really the architecture practices today, but I thought it was important to set a little bit of context on the overview and the system patterns as well, because I think they're also useful tools as you get into designing and implementing systems. Um, also just say really quickly, the, the architecture center, which is the website, and the framework which lives within the website is intended to span from concept all the way into technical details. I, I think Sam and I like to think of it a bit as a bridge between the high level kind of information you'll find on esri.com and the product documentation, which gets all into the details of how to do everything with our products. There's a, a number of really important decisions you need to make before you dive into the product documentation. It may even start with, should I use ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Enterprise, ArcGIS Platform, or some combination of those. We don't really do a good job, I don't think, outside of this in helping with a sort of a process to help you make those decisions. Although we've gotten better, I think that's kind of the mission of this website and this framework is to help you make informed decisions as you start to work towards the product documentation. But it's not gonna replace the product documentation. In fact, it links heavily to it because once we get to a certain level of detail, we take you into the, into the product documentation. But we also appreciate that we, out of necessity, we've started a bit more on the cons concept end of this, which means you may look at it and go, this doesn't have enough technical detail for me. We appreciate that. We do wanna hear from you though, if there's specific things you're missing or you're hoping to find there and not finding, uh, tell us and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Okay. Um, just, just quick orientation. You know, there are these four parts. Um, I think what's useful here uh, is the overview is a helpful way to introduce people to ArcGIS. I suspect most of you here probably know most of what's in this section. There may be a few things that are interesting like, you know, the architecture of ArcGIS is maybe a new way of thinking about it. But what I would just encourage you to do is like if you're engaging folks within IT or at a leadership level that don't know anything about GIS but are on the technical side, you can point them at this resource and they'll start learning how to sort of speak the language of, of GIS or at least understand how ArcGIS is organized and may fit within the organization. So I think that's useful. The other thing that I think is useful in here is system patterns. This in particular gets to this, if you remember we had those three, multifunction, GIS enabled, and then um, business focused systems. I think this is a language to start referring to business focused systems as different types of patterns. So a network management system is a type of data editing and management system. Um, um, you know, you may have, have other ones like that that can be mapped into one of these patterns. And this is also where I think we start getting a little bit more helpful in terms of com comparing what you can or can't do with different deployment options, which isn't the per like a complete resource to help you make decisions like, should I use ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Enterprise, or both? But I think it's starting to give you more tools to make some of those initial decisions about how to design and implement your system. Um, maybe with that, we'll talk about the practices for a minute and then get into the details. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. <clears throat> so the practices section really gets into the nuts and bolts of the kind of technical choices we make during design that range from, you know, really early things and kind of the foundation phase. So there might be uh, topics like choosing which components to use. Are you gonna use Windows or Linux? Use enterprise or online? How do you choose the apps that you might work with? Um, should I be extending and customizing things or working with just the out of the box functionality? These are foundational decisions that are made early on in the process. Uh, ideally, you're revisiting those throughout, but they're all pretty important. This section also includes a lot about the people and process parts of a successful system. So whether you choose any of the technologies, any of the approaches that are discussed above, it's equally important to consider things like governance, collaboration, the staff training that you have, 
and how you do things like change management or deliver new capabilities. These areas all build out of our previous technical paper from Esri, which was ArcGIS, Architecting the ArcGIS System Best Practices. You may have all seen that. That page is now incorporated into this website in whole and actually redirects to here. So you'll see some topics here that, that build from that. But what I want to talk about actually in more detail is these six pillars. We decided to incorporate pillars into the architecture framework because they really support the idea of a well-architected system. There's some nice analogies to houses and how you build them, et cetera. But also, this is really how our other partner organizations and uh, other vendors that we work with, other technology providers, how they talk about architecture through the lens of a design supported by strong pillars. So I'll go through each of these in a bit more detail. <clears throat> what we'll do for each pillar is first talk about you know, who to involve in the process. So from an automation perspective, we often think about involving the people that work with automation on a daily basis. Automation is a broad topic that includes things from workflow automation through DevOps, IAC, and software deployment. But the engineers who know those systems well and know what already works in your organization are a good group to talk to early on so you can learn from what they've already done. How your cloud system is designed or even your on-premises architecture is designed is also important. Architects define that and are the best uh, equipped to really relate to you what are the constraints and guidelines you should use in your own design. But also important are the business leads who are defining the requirements people like business analysts who work through workflows in great detail to give you very repeatable and well-understood systems, and then the end users that'll be the users of the system, the people running those workflows, what are they doing in the system that you've built? Those are the workloads you might look to automate and improve the either efficiency or productivity of their roles. In this design process that Whit described, I think it's important to involve certain groups at different phases, and so for each pillar, we'll talk about when to involve different groups and what we might do with them. Early on in the design process for automation, it's important to think about things like infrastructure as code and software deployment, because those are big decisions that have a big impact on how you might deploy the system. You don't want to be trying to change that horse midstream later on. During the design and implementation process, you're looking at the actual workflows that are involved, identifying them in great detail, and looking at what might be already suitable for automation. And then after you're operating the system, you're thinking about what opportunities there are to revisit old workflows, or identify new ones that are ripe for automation. For each pillar, we're also going to present what we think are some practices that are uh, emblematic of well-architected systems in kind of two groups. One, one, the things that with a check mark are really clearly required for a system to be considered well-architected. I don't think we're really comfortable having a really fine line on this yet. We're still thinking through ourselves what it means to say something is or isn't well-architected, because there's a lot of variation there. But the items with a checkbox are, are clear good approaches and good practices that we think support that definition. So the first in this area is to focus on the opportunity in front of you. You're looking for the workflows that either take a long time, have lots of problems, have a limited set of staff to support them. Those are the great candidates to automate in a workflow automation sense. It's not worth automating a workflow that gets done once a month manually and takes five minutes. You spend five hours doing that, that's really not a very good use of time. And so well-activated systems focus on those opportunity areas. We also see a lot of systems that work to improve both productivity and data and workflow quality through tools like Arcade and Python. You saw in the plenaries the various ways that Arcade is relevant to a system. One of the reasons we've built Arcade is to support productivity, automation, attribute rules, those different examples. And then kind of in the recommendations area, I think it's important that we don't overdo it. A system that's automated to, to, to as far of a line as possible is gonna be hard to change and work with and also makes your users feel like they don't have any agency in that system. We have some great tools and options with webhooks. This is a kind of an emerging area of automation that really helps with cross-system automation. So I'd look for that as a way to take more event-driven workflows or event-driven integrations and automations and bring them to a different system or bring them into your own system. We'll talk about observability as its own pillar later on, but it's important to think about observability in the context of automation as well, so that you're sure you're able to see, are these things working successfully? Are they reporting on time? Do I know when there's something that's failed so I don't find out from an end user who discovers their data is out of date? And then it's important with everything to iterate and revisit those workflows as you go through the system and make changes, because there may be new things that are created, new workflows that are uh, invented that are equally ripe for automation. 
In the security pillar, there's quite a different group to involve. Hopefully you have a rather robust cybersecurity group within your organization, or at least somebody who it's their main job to think about security um, or assurance of the security of your networks and your systems and your uh, users. That might take the role of a cyber team who has very clear requirements, very clear guidelines. Um, they can range in how easy they are to work with, as you probably experienced. But I also often try to look for the security or network architects who really understand why the, the system around your system. If you think about the foundation, maybe it's kind of the infrastructure around you, the streets, the pipelines, the street lights. Those things that support your own system are designed for a reason and have certain constraints and certain capabilities, and working with them can really help you to understand how you might align and ideally kind of rhyme with those choices rather than being dissonant to them. Identity management is often a really specifically called out role, especially in large enterprise organizations. Aligning to how you use users and authentication or authorization to give access to applications is really important. And if you don't get that right and have kind of a, a difficult experience or one that doesn't align to their requirements, it can be a big roadblock down the road. And then some organizations, like Esri ourselves, we have a collaboration team whose entire job is to look at ways that we can improve collaboration through data, through sharing the different platforms they can be a big help in understanding what's possible. And then overall, security cannot be involved early enough. It can be the biggest thing that takes down a design or stops you in your tracks partway through. So finding the right people to work with and working with them early is really important. And then keeping them involved continuously throughout is also a, a trademark of a system that is well architected. What that means is looking at uh, regular risk identification, being proactive about patches and updates and involving them as you make changes or bring new capabilities online so that nobody's surprised, everyone is aware, and everybody's happy with the choices that you're making. We hand selected the cheesiest animations yes. for this section, so I hope you guys Thursday enjoy. at four, yeah. we gotta get a little energy, so <laughs> the, good, the good ones are still coming. <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of practices, I think it's critical that you integrate a, a good system like this with your enterprise identity provider. What that means is that you're not using built-in logins. We all have built-in logins for simplicity. They're a great tool for early development. But to be considered an enterprise system, you need to be aligned to those practices. So using your SAML or OIDC, IDP is really important. We also think it's important to always be deploying late, the latest releases and patches, of course, in line with your own schedule and plans, both at the operating system level and, of course, for the Esri software. <clears throat> we, we know that upgrades and updates are, are, are impactful and difficult at times but it is by far one of the best ways to reduce the security vulnerability surface of your system by getting new software deployed, our new third-party components applied, and just it'll make your security team happy to know that you're at the latest release and it's being patched first before the old ones. And then I think, again, actively reviewing your security posture, meaning how you approach things like user access and authorization or patching, and being proactive about working with the right team and involving them in that. Those are kind of the, the definite check marks on this page. Other areas that we see a lot of challenges in, so doing well in those areas is, are important. I think looking at certificate management in all its different flavors and being proactive about that is important for your system to not have unexpected downtime. Taking a least privileges approach, where you basically look at giving people privileges that are what they need for their role and then only expanding those based on requests or um, approval by others. While that's a lot of work, it is good from a security perspective to uh, apply that approach, just like the cloud providers do to their own systems. As you integrate third-party tools for things like security scanning or compliance, that can be a great help. It can also lead to a lot of false positives and scans you have to scroll through with thousands of findings that are not really important. So just do so carefully and do so with the support of your security team. And then think about not just the security from the auth uh, perspective or certificates, but also things like privacy and compliance. The Trust Center has a lot of great resources on that. I'll briefly show that if you're not familiar. The ArcGIS Trust Center provides a lot of resources about things like compliance and encryption and very low-level topics. Um, it has a wealth of documents and guidance that is really important that we uh, link to frequently from the framework and uh, use as a resource ourselves. Um, also, just to note, a recent release, this new Enterprise Hardening Guide, is a, I think, several hundred page document that goes into great detail about the kinds of controls you can apply to an Archer's Enterprise system to uh, harden against security and vulnerabilities. Maybe one quick comment. I mean, this is, um, this tends to be on the top one or two concerns of CIOs like every year from what I recall for the last five years. It's probably somewhat obvious, but you know, once we get into 
like implementing a system and, and you know, you're really trying to get something done, security can start to feel like it's in the way. But I think it's just helpful to step back on occasion and remember how important this is. I mean, the, the internet facing systems that we use get hacked all the time. Um, I know my identity has been leaked a number of times and that's not okay with me. And so it, it's, it's just really important to take this seriously. And like Sam said, the earlier we can do it in the process, the more smooth it'll go, it'll go and involving the right people. Just want to highlight that this one really is critical. Yeah. yeah. Integration is the third pillar of, of content in the framework. Um, integration is of great interest to enterprise systems because you don't want to duplicate functionality. Um, and being successful in this space means you have to involve people like business and IT leadership, the people that build other systems, uh, the architects that were involved in designing those other systems and know what they can and can't support or their endpoints they support for integration. At a low level, developers and engineers who might be the ones building your integration. And then looking at the other technology providers, if there's a company involved in building the tech for a system you want to integrate with, looking at how they support integrations is a great path to knowing what might be efficient or feasible. We want to work with these teams early in the requirements phase. During the design, we want to kind of look at how we integrate and then test integrations in those POCs or early phases. Uh, we want to apply our other pillars like security and reliability or automation to the integration. These are kind of self-referencing. And then after we've done our design and we're kind of operating the system, we want to react to how things change. So if a system upgrades and they lose an endpoint or they move to a different platform entirely, if that's critical to your workflows and your system, you need to be planning early with them how you're going to move to their new system on the same day that they make the upgrade. So integrations are a good way to make systems work together, but also introduce some of those dependencies. As the bounce. Yeah. In terms of the practices, um, you know, think carefully about what you're integrating, the approach to that, why you're doing so, and then how you're going to do that. Those are all equally important to know the what or the scope the why meaning the business need, and then the how or the technical method that you, that you use to achieve that. I also think it's important to use existing platforms. You know, if you're already using uh, Azure Data Factory to do integrations in seven other systems, if you're doing your own integration at an ETL level and you're going to be the first people deploying FME, for example, that may be fine, but maybe it's a lot more efficient to look at what you already use in the organization where you already have staff training, observability, support for that, and especially if there's IT support for that pattern using that platform might be more efficient, or probably is more efficient. And then also respect the constraints of your system. If you don't have network access, or you don't have access to the right software, uh, or data confidentiality restricts that, you have to understand that early on, and not try to change that through your integration, but really work within those boundaries. I also would think about kind of the benefits or the cost-benefit analysis of real-time integration versus a more scheduled integration. We do a lot of data integration here at Esri. You all pro are probably very involved in that. Real-time integration, where things are kind of bopping around the system and updating different systems in real time and webhooks, that's all great, but it can be expensive to set that up and manage that. And if you don't really need that real-time access, you can do it a lot cheaper and a lot safer through scheduling and think about that as having some advantages. Uh, starting simple with integration and then kind of monitoring it over time, evolving that and hardening it so they're more durable is really important. I mentioned webhooks before, they're also of interest here, um, both for automation and integration purposes. And if you're working with an external system, try to look if they have client libraries you can work with. They often might have Python tools or um, ODBC connections or things like that that can let you connect to those systems easily and save you some time in the development process. One thing real quick, or maybe two. So as a, like an architect and an engineer and just generally someone that geeks out on technology a lot, like this can be a lot of fun. Like I really enjoy, it's, it's challenging, but it can be really f like, fun and interesting and different. So if you're like me, don't steer away from integration because it feels like a bit of a slog. It can be really actually fun technology to get into and present some interesting challenges. But the other thing that I think is probably more important than that is this can be one of the things that really excites the business. When they see data from two systems brought together or when they see maps in their CRM system, like that stuff can just you know, get, really excite the business, create light bulb ideas for new integrations and new possibilities. Um, it's just, it's worth investing in this, I think, if you, if you it's can. High, high value. High value, yeah. 
Observability is probably the pillar that was newest to us, and you'll see on the website has the fewest individual articles, but I think is maybe the biggest opportunity area for, for us to learn about in our systems to reflect. On this, we want to involve people who manage infrastructure, the network admins, the storage admins, the VM controllers, but also operations teams, the people that are picking up their pagers or answering help desk tickets. Those teams know how to manage a system and what they are looking for in terms of observability, and they can be a big help. And users also have a role here because you want to be able to look at what they're doing and observe that remotely and know when there's interruption to them uh, before, the, before they actually know themselves, ideally. In the design process, observability usually comes up after you've kind of gone to that logical level of design. Once you know which components you have, they're well-defined, you can then think about how you might observe those and work with them. And then after you've done the design, you want to keep refining this either as you add new server roles, new workflows or capabilities, and also importantly, based on your experience of the system. What are the things I'm looking for and learning from the system, and am I missing a few things in my dashboard or observability tool? In terms of the practices, um, first, I say, I'd say look at what you're already doing in the organization. Is there already a tool that they're using that you can build on that already has people that know it, that manage it 24 hours a day, ideally, because you don't want that to be your job, I can guarantee it. And so if you have a tool they're already using, can you add the monitoring of your GIS-based system to that for an efficiency gain? If you're building custom apps, think about how you might observe their operations. Building logging into things and building logs into scripts or ETLs is obvious, but also in custom apps, you want to look at how you either log the user activity um, or look at telemetry of what they're doing. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Look at the telemetry of what they're doing so you can learn from that and observe in those interruptions. And then importantly, you know, don't observe just for the, for the heck of it. You want to use that to inform action in your system. So don't uh, observe things just to build up a nice report that shows a KPI This is 100% uptime. Make sure you're observing things so that you can take action on changes and ideally be improving the system. You may already be familiar with ArcGIS Monitor. It's a great tool that has some especially good ArcGIS specific tooling. Um, but balance that with what you already use in the organization. There's no one right answer here. Just know that that's out there. And last, I think making sure that the noise that you get, the number of alerts that you get, doesn't overwhelm the signal is really important. This is only useful if you really can use the information and build from that. The performance and scalability pillar uh, involves many of the same teams that we've already talked about. Um, importantly, I think focusing on end users and clients, understanding how they use the system is really critical here. Early on in the process, we want to involve these teams to understand what are their expectations and can we set their expectations properly. You know, I, I work in a services group, so we look at a lot of RFPs for projects, and all these RFPs that have things like every map must draw in three seconds or less are basically impossible to satisfy, right? And so setting expectations, knowing what's, what's achievable, because these th systems like this are not as simple as just an API call or a workflow execution. They have lots going on. Mapping is complicated. And so setting expectations about what we can achieve with a system, given how much you've invested or what you're planning, is important. Then during operations, we're gonna be monitoring and establishing a baseline, measuring the performance, understanding what we can expect as a baseline level, and then iterating on that to make improvements throughout. That baseline's really important, and we, we kind of hammer on that because you don't know that you're deviating from that until you have your baseline. If you don't do that, and you get a, a request from a user saying, hey, everything is slow today, how do you either validate or refute that? You have no information to work from. And so you have to have that baseline of performance to know when you deviate from that. You also have to be looking for degradation, not waiting for that call. So this goes back to observability and monitoring, but regularly checking on where you're at uh, helps you to do better overall. We do want to design in a way that we can scale and look, and look at scaling flexibly, not just building the biggest thing we have at first, but building for that expansion in response to load. And then we want to look at actively pursuing improvements over time. I do want to distinguish this idea of experience performance, when somebody says things are slow, obviously they're not making that up unless they're being a little malicious. So somebody who's experiencing performance, if you're measuring the system is doing well, well that gap is important to look at. Is it their network connection, their device, or something user specific that's happening? That can help you identify what the problem might lie in. And then being, being kind of upfront early on about what's possible and being collaborative in feedback, performance is, is the biggest contributor to user happiness uh, or the biggest contributor to user unhappiness if it's not going well. And so being collaborative is really important and accepting that feedback when it comes in. Our last pillar is reliability. Uh, really the same groups are involved from the IT design perspective. Um, early on we want to in involve them in, in establishing what they can expect from the system. 
Again, if there's an, a kind of overly optimistic expectation, like a really high SLA number, that can lead you to design a system that isn't really fitting the actual requirements that they have. And so working really early on to involve what we might expect the system to do and how we can achieve that uh, is important. And then we design the system and we validate that we're meeting that goal. So measuring whether you're actually hitting that availability level, whether you're actually as reliable as you think you are, that's important in order to build trust that you're at that proper level of SLA. So target really an appropriate approach. You know, it's not just true that more is always better in reliability. Being highly available is only as good as your system's ability to live up to that goal. So if you don't have the right team or you don't have a 24-7 watch desk, you really can't be 24-7 available. So let's not go for just being more highly available or being more reliable for the sake of it, but really for what fits your needs. Understand that these are, there are many links in these systems, so you might be relying on a database or an IDP for your authentication, uh, or even a reverse proxy that you don't manage in your DMZ. If those things are down, your system is down. So your system can be as good as you want it to be, and it can be in perfect, beautiful working order, but if you can't log in, it's pretty worthless. And so understanding what are your weakest links and how you rely on those things is important to having a holistic view of reliability. Workload separation is a good balance, uh, a good balanced approach. Uh, that's covered more in the framework. Um, and then it's important if you do focus a lot on reliability that you mirror that same technical architecture in a lower environment so you can test and validate that. If you're set up in HA and it's only in production and you have an HA outage, you have nowhere to test your recovery for that or even know how to work with that other than that one system. And so this is one of the primary uses of a staging environment or pre-production system is to mirror that level of service and availability that you have there. In this area, the people are really important, making sure that they know what to do and when, that they're properly trained to support you and you work with the right teams is really important. And I think importantly, you know, integration is, as we've covered is really great, but recognize that really cross-integrated systems are cross-linked and are re reliant on each other, so they're just natively less reliable, right? If you're relying on a, an ETL workflow, you now have two systems you rely on for your success. The more you do that, the more systems there are, the higher the odds are that something's not working at a given time, and that kind of begins to chip away at your, at your numbers or at your goal. Mm. All of these are covered in more detail on the website. I won't go into them, but there are articles in each of these areas that are outside of what I talked about, um, and that go into some, I think, very helpful guidance around technology, around how to think about these in the design process. And I encourage you to look at these if you're in a certain area or doing a design to find out more about how we approach this from Esri's perspective and how we recommend uh, that you look at it as well. Thanks, Sam. Uh, maybe a couple quick things on reliability. Um, whoop. Uh, it's just static, it comes back. Oh, okay. Um, we often like neglect backups, I think. Uh, in a lot of cases, we jump straight to like high availability. We need fault tolerance and redundancy. But in a lot of cases, just having good regular backups of the system or even just backups of the data is good enough for the business need. And so, you know, unless you have really strict requirements that drive towards high availability and such, you might consider a simpler system, but leaning into a backup strategy. Um, and the other thing is just, I think Sam said it, just to maybe reiterate, like a well-architected system isn't inherently high availability or, you know, super, super reliable. It's really about this idea of intention, about really understanding what the needs are and getting to the bottom of the, of the real requirements now and to the degree that you can where they may go and then designing the system to those needs, which doesn't necessarily mean crazy secure, super reliable, incredibly fast because those things all um, take effort and money and may or may not be worth the value in your case. Um, I'm not gonna go back through this again. I just wanted to maybe re revisit this idea of all of these best practices should be considered in the context of a process. Um, Sam told us a bit about when certain like technical focus areas or architectural pillars should be considered throughout this process as well as who to consider involving at that point of time. And I think that's maybe a, a key point is that Enterprise systems and maybe well-architected systems generally take a village to design, implement, and operate successfully. And so think about who those people are within your organization and when to engage them. 
The other thing, though, we just wanted to maybe leave you with before we wrap up is, you know, we, we spent most of the time talking about technology. Uh, we did want to kind of end with this idea that, that really implementing a well-architected system does go beyond technology. So we can imagine starting where we are now, which may be nothing, or you may have an existing system. We'll call that current state and moving to a future state. We've talked about architecture as being a key um, component to getting from current state to future state, as well as process. We also wanted to highlight the importance of release management, of people, ensuring your, your, your staff are skilled and trained. And in addition to training, the staff that are designing, implementing, and operating also think about the users of the system. Do the users need to be trained? And that gets into this whole area of change management, which isn't really the thrust of our topic here today, but we just wanted to highlight that change management can be a huge factor, not just in like building the well-architected system, but ensuring that it's adopted and used successfully, that it deliver, truly delivers what the business needs. It can meet all the functional requirements, but if the users won't use it because they're, they don't like it or they weren't prepared for it or they're not trained for it, the best system that's not used is not gonna help your organization. So do consider these things and also know that um, as much as you do this for one system, it's also important that the organization as a whole is set up to support you with this. Um, we kind of refer to this as like the right context or organizational practices that can enable success. Um, we've talked about a couple of these already today, but we, di we didn't really get into this idea of like strategy, governance, and engagement. Um, we're not gonna get into them today, but we wanted to share with you another resource we have a QR code coming in a minute, so don't feel the need to try to write down the URL. Um, this is a, a new site that's come out of Esri as well that's gonna continue to be developed that has these like five areas to consider in your path to GIS success. So strategy, governance, data and technology, engagement, and skills development. And you dig into these in more detail and you can learn some more higher level best practices that, again, deal with this kind of organizational practices and context that pave the way for a well-architected system. We just kind of want to leave you with that. Um, this is a final reminder. Um, I, you know, I guess if you take anything away from this, keep these five things in mind as you move forward with your system. Um, this, is, in our mind, are the top five sort of things that help make a system well-architected. It really delivers what the business needs. It's business first, not technology first. It's intentionally designed to meet the needs of the business, which means really understanding the needs, but then deciding what to do, or as Sam said, what not to do based on those needs, considering things like people and costs as well. You know, starting with a strong foundation and then evolving. Don't get stressed out about capacity planning all the time, especially if you're working in the cloud. Focus on things like the pillars so you have the foundation on which to grow. It's easy to switch machine sizes. It's hard to re-architect to be more secure. Um, consider best practices. Tell us where we're not talking about certain things, at least in the architecture center, but also consider the best practices of your organization and specifically IT. And then know that the work is never done. We deploy a system. It's going through this cycle of health, but then we also need to think about that bigger cycle of revisiting, re-architecting, upgrading, um, to keep evolving it with the needs of business and IT. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Um, we've got these two QR codes. I don't know why there's a dinosaur, but Chrome seems to put it in there when you generate it from Chrome, so it's kind of cute. Um, the Architecture Center is just architecture.arcgs.com, pretty easy to remember, but the path to GI success is a long URL, so make sure you get that one. I'll give you guys just a minute. Yeah, and then we used pretty much the full hour. We figured we would, a lot of content to cover here, so thanks for staying. But uh, we're both here to answer questions, and I think we can go into, uh, go into those if you have any and um, stick around to chat, so. And uh, do yeah. provide us feedback on the Architecture Center through the Architecture Center. I'll just show you that really quickly in yeah. here. 
If you go to the bottom of any of these pages, there's a tell us what you think link that doesn't go into some suggestion box on top of the trash can. It goes straight into our GitHub repository as issues. And tell us what you think about this session. It's the first time we've done a format like this. We take the feedback very seriously. So things you like, things you didn't tell us. Thanks. Yeah.